Hello, everyone. Welcome to Dreamers and Doers. My name is Anand Palagar. I'm the founder of Dream Large. I'm going to ask you all to grab a last drink, grab a seat. We have a lot of space in the house. We've got people still drifting in. But we're going to get started on tonight's conversation. So grab a seat. I'm going to have you. <laughs> so my name is Anand. I'm the founder of Dream Large. Dream Large was founded with one guiding principle, and that was that wherever you are, whatever you do, you have a duty to serve your community. And that's what tonight, events like tonight are really all about. We believe that you can use business as a force for good. And what you'll find a theme in a lot of these speakers is that they're doing the same thing in their own way. And that's really what Dreamers and Doers is all about. It's to inspire you. It's to help you understand how they did it, why they did it, and how you could potentially gain and grow through their experiences here in Sarasota. So I wanted to first welcome you to where you are today, which is the Bay. Show of hands, how many, for how many of you is this your first time here in this building? In this building. What about the second time here? Okay. And for how many of you is this the first time you've ever been on the side of the bay? Site of the bay, this particular site. Okay. So this is an introduction for many of you. And what many of you might have seen is this picture here which is a bird's eye view of the 53 acre park that's under development. I would be killed by a gentleman over here if I didn't recognize that there is a performing arts hall right there in the center of it. And so this park is really a transformational project because what the Bay is doing here is taking what is a parking lot and transforming it into paradise. And this project started years ago, and you're gonna hear that story, the genesis of it, but ultimately, where you're sitting today is in the heart of phase one. Phase one is um, the first about 12 to 14 acres, and you are sitting where that red box is. And so this is all significant because the people that are building this park are here in the room. I have to recognize Bill Waddell in the back corner over here. Bill, wave. Bill is design, engineering, and implementing this park. There are partners in the audience as well. I know there are some of the architects, some of the team who are working on it uh, in various capacities, but it really is a broad community effort that's driven both by philanthropy, driven by you, the people, in terms of the, the inputs that you gave us. And ultimately, this is what you can expect to see at the end of this year when we officially open what will be phase one of the park. So it's exciting times ahead. So I want to thank you all for coming out tonight. And I also need to just do, take a moment to thank some of our partners who've made this possible. Gulf Coast Community Foundation and the Economic uh, Development Corporation of Sarasota County. I also need to thank One Park. One Park, for those of you that don't know, are building a new development across the street from here. And they are going to help us open the park this fall. And you're going to hear about that at the end of tonight's talk. Our media partner, Sarasota Magazine. We have a stage partner, which is Home Resource. And there are three firms that have brought out crews of people, and I want to recognize each of them because they've supported us from the very beginning. That is Bold, and I see those guys somewhere in here. Net Reputation, at large. And that kind of brings us to our Dreamers and Doers series. So I want to start off by thanking my team as well, who helped put this event together, Dream Large. You met them when you came in. They dotted around the room. You're in for a real treat tonight. Tonight you're gonna to hear from someone who I think is kind of a legend in not only the community, but more specifically the restaurant community. What he has managed to accomplish over the past, gosh, I don't know how old you are, Michael, but many, many years and decades is, is truly amazing. And I've had the chance to get to know Michael pretty much since I moved to town. And so to learn his story over the years has been somewhat uh, of a transformative moment for me. And that's really a theme that you're seeing in these speakers that we have organized for our dreamers and doers. For those of you that were here last time, you heard from A.G. Laffley, who's accomplished things you know, that many of us can't even imagine. And Michael tonight, you're gonna hear about, and following Michael is Michael Saunders. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Julia Groom, who's the director of Dream Large. Um, she's gonna take this away and lead this conversation with Michael Claver. Thanks, Julia. Oh, one last thing while you guys get mic'd up. If you have a question, we have an interactive questionnaire. It is at dreamlarger.org. It's on the URLs on these banners. 
if you uh, want to ask a question, you can do it digitally. Secondly, if you're going to tag a photo, we have two hashtags, Dream Large and Dream, Dreamers and Doers. So please use those hashtags. And without further ado, we're going to turn it over to Julia and Michael. Hello. Hello, everybody, and welcome. <laughs> welcome to Dreamers and Doers. My name is Julia Groom, and we're here to have an amazing conversation with none other than, oh, it's going to be great, <laughs> with Michael Clauber. You never know what this guy's going to say. That's true. <clears throat> Who is an OG restaurant leader here in Ooh. town who has had some of the most successful restaurants from you know, Michael's on East that has been around for 35 years, which is quite impressive. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I know I'm very excited to have this conversation and I hope that you are too. I'm excited to be here, especially great. in this place. Yes. I mean, that's actually you know, a, great, a great place to start. So as Anand mentioned, we're here at the Bay Park and a lot of people might not know that Michael has been an instrumental piece of creating the Bay Park. So do you want to tell us a little bit about how, uh, how the Bay got started? Wow. Um, it's kind of a long story, but um, I'll, I'll try and do it briefly. But you know, this room is especially um, a special place for me because one of the first charrettes that we did with the community to really listen to what people wanted to see happen was right here and Chantel Norman helped organize that with Visit Sarasota County and that's really how it started for me. I was on mm -hmm. the board of Visit Sarasota County at the time. This is 2013. I was the board mm -hmm. chair and uh, I was invited to go with a group of community leaders, EDC, chamber, elected officials on a uh, learning trip to, yep. to yep. Nashville, Tennessee and I see John Thaxon is here. He was on the trip too um, and uh, it was it was, it was exciting. We were mm -hmm. learning all different things about what made you know, Nashville happen, but it was one area that they were taking, they were, they were redeveloping an area that was blighted. Mm -hmm. And uh, it really caught my attention, the passion, how they were doing it, what was happening, uh, and it, it hit me. And, and I remember we got back on the bus to go to the next stop, and uh, John was sitting right there with me too, and I had a city, manager and a county administrator on, on one side of each side of me and I said you know what I just saw is something we really ought to think about doing in Sarasota we can do this and so we got back into town and getting together Virginia Haley was was with me and she was our our board president or the president of the organization mm -hmm. and we were working on uh, setting up the um, the board retreat and we were going to have a bunch of different things to discuss and maybe get the board to, to focus on. And I said, Virginia, I really want to think about the bay, mm -hmm. the, the Van Wezel property. And you know, we really should look at that. And I convinced her that we could go meet with uh, the city planners. And they pulled up a Google map. And I said, what's all in play right now? Because at one point, uh, we had a couple of restaurants at the mm -hmm. Quay, which is obviously now empty and was a piece of big piece of grass at that yep. point and I knew that there was going to be this other project across the street from that which was going to be a billion dollar project called the proscenium okay. so we met with the city we also had the park on the on the north side of it and they did a Google map and they outlined all four of these areas and mm -hmm. it turned out that it was 75 acres of underutilized land and I right? said I just got goosebumps right now when I just thought about it because I said, when in our lifetimes are we ever going to see an opportunity like this? Yeah. And what are they going to say 50 years from now when we had this laid out in front of us? And what did we do with this information? Mm -hmm. That's really how it got started. And you know, made a presentation um, to the board. Um, Drayton Saunders is here. He was there that day. Yeah. And 12 great people that were on our uh, Visit Sarasota County board. Chantel can tell you their mouths were open. When we started, it, we pulled up this big board. We made a you know big board of the map and showed it to everyone, and they were all shocked because nobody had been thinking about 
um, all of this in play at the same mm -hmm. time. And how does it feel to be part of that pivotal moment, right, that the creation of an idea to turn what is uh, essentially a big parking lot into a huge, open, accessible public park? I come from a family of dreamers. My dad was a big dreamer. Mm -hmm. And, you know, to be honest, uh, in about 1970, he helped redevelop the whole property where the Quay and the Hyatt and Watergate Tower are. And part of that, part of that master plan included mm -hmm. the area where this first phase is going up. Yeah. So I heard about that, I knew about that, and um, you know, he did, that whole development didn't happen the way that he wanted, but you know, it was a big dream. Yeah. And yeah. those of you who know my dad um, also had a big dream for downtown Sarasota. 20 years or 25 years ago, 20 mm -hmm. years or so, um, that would have been unbelievable if we had it today. If you ever get a chance to go look at that master plan, it was really incredible. So, you know, for me it was, you know, following a dream, but bringing, you know, bringing something to our community to really think about. Mm -hmm. This is gonna be our Central Park. It is, yep. And it had hit me as we started to learn more about how to do it. And it, um, we got a group of us together, and it was John Thaxton and Virginia Haley and Drayton Saunders and Joe McKenna. And we started, we traveled around the country and visited different, mm -hmm. different parks and different performing arts halls. We had the Van Wezel team with us. We had the orchestra team with us. We went to New York to go study, you know, how they did some of the great parks there. And we got connected with HRNA, who's the firm that mm -hmm. um, helped master plan or helped the community um, come to terms with how to do Brooklyn Bridge Park. Okay. Which there was mm -hmm. a whole story of 11 years of how long it took to get that park out of the ground. They also helped um, to make the, the High Line happen. So um, we brought mm -hmm. them in, we brought them on board with the help of Gulf Coast Community Foundation um, yeah. to be able to help us um, to get them on board. And I remember Drayton and I led, a, led a, a meeting. We invited a bunch of business leaders to Michael's Wine Cellar and mm -hmm. to pitch this idea and to help raise some money. And all we had was that big board. We didn't have anything else to share with them. But you know, we got a group of community yeah. leaders together and business leaders, and they all contributed. And that's how we, we got started. And sometimes that's all it takes, right? A couple people with a great idea and you know, putting energy into yeah. that idea. And so when you went on that trip, and it was the trip that really started all of this, um, it's because you're on the board of Visit Sarasota. So I kind of want to skip back, right? So you ended up on the board of Visit Sarasota, and let's say 35 or so years before that, you started a restaurant called Michael's on East. And let's say 20 or so more years before that, you started um, your, your first job by washing windows, right? You want to tell us a little so bit about that? My family, my dreamer dad also bought the aging resort on Longboat Key called The Colony and um, redeveloped it into The Colony Beach and Tennis Resort. Mm -hmm. uh, we moved here uh, in 1969. Um, I was a, you know, a young teenager. My next year, my dad took over this resort, not knowing how to run a resort. He was a dentist. Um, so this was everything that he hated about all his dental meetings was going to hotels that had those one rooms. Um, and mm -hmm. he decided he was going to build the first hotel with all suites. Um, friend Jack Daniels and Gail are here. And Jack was actually one of the colony unit owners at the time, too. Wow. So um, later on. So it was, um, you know, it was kind of given that my sister, Katie, and, mm -hmm. and my brother, Tommy, my younger brother and sister, we're all going to be part of it, and we all were pitching in and doing everything we could, including Sunday night cocktail parties for however many guests were there, okay. where we had to dress up and welcome the guests. And mm -hmm. I think that was my first opportunity to really interact with people like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess I seemed to like it. But my first job, the restaurant was right on the beach. It's like <laughs> if this was the windows, you went 50 feet out and the Gulf of Mexico was there. My first job was washing the windows of that restaurant. And any time there was any yeah, kind of you. surf, the spray would come up, and it was time to go wash those windows again. So from there, I graduated to washing dishes. Okay. Um, my dad believed that to be in the business, we had to be able to do every job that mm -hmm. was there. So it meant you know, housekeeping. And I convinced him to pay us by the room instead of by the hour. Um, <laughs> 
my college roommate and I were on the beach by noon every day. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was you know it was a it was a learning experience yeah. all the way through bussing tables, waiting tables, working in the kitchen, you know, flipping uh, hamburgers, making pancakes on the Sunday brunch. You know, mm -hmm. we did it all. You did it all. Yeah. And I bet that shaped your work ethic, right? And it, it kind of changed who you are. And I'm sure you apply those same principles to the work that you do now. I think I do because I've you know I really do appreciate the fact that there probably isn't any job in my operation that I haven't done and that mm -hmm. I couldn't do and no job I probably had to jump in and do mm -hmm. um, many times over the years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you started at the colony, washing windows, bussing tables, and then what did you do after that? You know, what did you study in school? So um, after high school, Sarasota High School is my alma mater. If there's anybody, any sailors here, go sailors. Um, and I ended up getting accepted to Cornell University to the School of Hotel and Restaurant Administration okay. in Ithaca, New York, um, which was, you know, which was great. My, my other choice was University of Denver, and I really wanted to ski, but my dad convinced me that Cornell was the choice. Mm -hmm. um, I was not a great student. No, okay. You were not a great student. I was not. <laughs> um, I thought I was going to to go up there and learn how to run a restaurant and you know learn how to cook and you know learn more about every aspect of it and I found yeah. myself mostly in classes learning financial planning, labor relations, okay. you know. So I took on jobs in restaurants and bars um, in town which tend to take a little bit of time away from studying. Yeah. Um, yeah. And along the way, you know, the dean would call me into his office, you know, now and then to kind of refresh my memory about why I was really there. <laughs> College was a lot of fun, too. You guys know that. Oh, um, too much fun sometimes. Too much fun. <laughs> but um, he, brought, he finally brought me in after, in my third year and said, you know, Michael, this is not really working. You, okay. you really, you know, I'm going to gently but firmly push you out the door mm -hmm. until you need to go and find your way. Okay. And, um, and where'd that take you? Well, first it crushed me. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, as a kid, the hardest thing you got to do is tell your mom and dad that you basically got kicked out of school. Um, but I was very lucky and I had... <clears throat> I had an opportunity to go to New Orleans mm -hmm. uh, and be the first management trainee for Sinesta Hotels. Amazing. Uh, beautiful hotel, the Royal Sinesta, yeah. right on Bourbon Street. Right on Bourbon Street. Um, mm -hmm. And the general manager, you know, I was the guinea pig for this whole program for them, took me under his wing, and uh, they kicked my butt. But every six weeks, they had me in a different part of the hotel, working in the restaurants, you know, working in the bar, yeah. working in the kitchen. I loved it. I mean, it was like, you know, keep me moving. Mm -hmm. And about two years into it, he brought me up to his office and said, hey, I'm, I'm leaving here after 20 years, and I'm buying Arno's restaurant across the street, directly across the street, a, 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 a restaurant that was built in 1918, wow. um, and had been really let go for decades, mm -hmm. um, to the point where there was very little of it open. Um, Archie said, um, he said, Michael, he goes, I made a deal with Sinesta that I could take you with me. Uh, he agreed not to take any other staff in order to be able to still be, a, you know, still be able to walk in the door. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got to spend two years with him as we restored and renovated that, that uh, incredible restaurant. That's and amazing. So great experience. I did learn a lot about cash flow because he ran out of money regularly. Okay. <laughs> Well, that's an we important sold lesson. tables. We sold <laughs> tables in the dining room when it got really desperate. Oh man! Well, it's it's great because you took this, you know, what some could perceive as a failure, right? Kind of more or less getting pushed out of college to, you know, try out the real world, and you made it into something amazing, right? You you I created mean, if, something out of it. If I can be honest, it was out to show them that I could do it. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. after that failure, had to fight. You know, I got to I got to be able to show them I can do it. That's great. So then you spent years in, in New Orleans, which is obviously a cultural hub, a food hub, and you probably learned much more than you know we can even imagine. And then you came back and you, you brought those learnings to Sarasota. So tell us what it was like coming back. Well, while we were in New Orleans and reopening the restaurant, um, we, we, we had a great chef that was 
also doing the wine list, it turned out that mm -hmm. he was telling all the distributors before we opened, if you want this wine on the list, um, deliver a case to my house. And I guess his neighborhood was happy every Friday night when he hosted <laughs> block parties. I bet. So Archie said to me, um, Michael, he goes, you know, I fired him. And you took a couple of courses at Cornell. And I'm like, yeah, I did. It was one or two. He goes, great. He goes, you're going to do the wine list. And by the way, I want the best list in the city. So wow. I took up wine and self-defense, went to our local wholesale distributor, retailer, and said, help me, guys. Mm -hmm. Spent $200 on wine, $200 on books that day, and never looked back. Fell in love with mm -hmm. it. And at the time, there really was no real like, wine industry in Sarasota, right? It was pretty I like barren. to say Sarasota was a wine wasteland, wine wasteland. When, I, <laughs> when I came back here. And I, I look at the Colony wine list, and there were 25 yeah. wines on it. I still have a copy of it. And when I left, there was probably thousand wines on it, Jack? I don't even know. But yes. So it was, um, it was an amazing, fun mm -hmm. challenge. That's great. And then, so that kind of brings us around to when you started Michael's on East. You know, a whole 35 years ago. It's Michael's on East, the wine cellar, the ballroom. And, you know, 35 years is obviously, it's longer than I've been alive. It's longer than some of you guys have been alive. <laughs> and I, it's just... <laughs> That's not fair. <laughs> I'm still 27. What do you mean? Oh, Come on. You look very sharp. In my mind. <laughs> you look very sharp. And, but you know what? I want to make the point that I think that there's probably a lot of people, you know, people from Bold, Net Reputation, who are probably in the same point in their life where you were at when you were deciding to start Michael Zani's. Like, you know, maybe they're trying to start something new. Maybe they're you know, feeling really optimistic. Maybe they're feeling scared. So can you tell us, you know, what was it like trying to start Michael's on East? So I had been managing the food and beverage operation at the resort. Mm -hmm. you know, I came back in 1980 um, and really had to do a turnaround job on that because um, I didn't have any yeah. idea how financially in trouble it was until I got in there for a few months. I but I, I, I ran the operation for about six years and realized we'd gotten really as far as we could get. Every major national award. Um, we represented Florida in the 1994 inauguration of Ronald Reagan. Wow. Um, you mm -hmm. know, that was a big deal. You saw a picture there of receiving the grand award from the Wine Spectator in 1982. Um, so I'd gotten, you know, all the, I'd taken the family resort to where yeah. I thought I could. My younger brother and sister were there. Mm -hmm. It's like, guys, okay, it's your turn. Um, and decided to jump out on my own. Try and, something new. Um, it was scary and yeah. challenging, mm -hmm. um, but I was going to continue to show them that I could do it. You're a fighter. Whoever that is, the big guy up there, I'm not sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. so, but um, yeah, it was, you know, it was a commitment to do it. And mm -hmm. you know, in those days, um, you know, the location that I chose, the backside of a, yep. of a mall. Yes. Um, mm -hmm in mid Sarasota, um, you know, was a gutsy move. And, yeah. you know, my friend Jack was with me the day that I walked through the hardware store that was there and said, we can do this. So um, <laughs> that's probably his broker calling. <laughs> it's good timing. <laughs> but, um, you know, then how do you do it and where do you get, I, you know, obviously right. my family wasn't gonna, you know, help me. Yeah. My dad was pissed that I was leaving. Mm -hmm. And um, and so came up with you know the concept of a limited partnership. There was no bank mm -hmm. that was going to talk to me, right. um, you know, especially in that period. Um, me with real no backing. I had a home. I ended up selling my home um, to raise some of the money. Wow! Uh, but I d created a limited partnership and uh, sold twenty-five thousand and fifty thousand dollars shares to seventeen locals. 17. 17 local. Wow. So I had 17 partners. And um, I can tell you, every one of those meetings was scary as hell. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, I was passionate about it. Yeah. Um, I had a dream. You know, it was in my head what it was going to look like, what mm -hmm. it was going to feel like. Yeah. Um, had done a lot of traveling in California mm -hmm. and was inspired by California cuisine and believed that we could do it. There's a picture of opening of the restaurant, believe it or not, and the wine spectator, and all of that. But mm -hmm. it's, um, 
you know, it was, it was a great challenge. 17 partners. Um, I overshot the budget on the build out a little bit, which is I'm known bit. to do sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and the chef that I brought in from California was, Sarasota was not quite ready for all the smoked foods that were going to be done. We had a smoker in the kitchen that you could stand in. And in 1987, Sarasota was not ready for that. We had an mm -hmm. open kitchen, which nobody had really done yet. I'd seen it in California, wanted to bring it back. Um, and so, you know, we struggled. Yeah. Um, and, and so in getting those 17 partners, 17 investors, it, it can be really hard to get one person to believe in you, right? And so how did you manage to get them all on board? And what was that like? You know, I had... You know, I had a I had a business plan. Yeah. Um, I had a lot of photos of different places and menus to show them. Mm -hmm. You know, reasons why I thought it could work. Um, one of the things that I've always done or always felt, I think it started when I when I came back to Sarasota um, from New Orleans, was I wanted to bring people new things. Yeah. Things that they hadn't experienced mm -hmm. before. And obviously, wines was a pretty easy one. Yeah. But. Um, that was all about, you know, bringing new ideas, new dishes, mm -hmm. back Innovating. to show our community. Mm -hmm. That's great. And, you know, just to kind of put a finer point on how amazing it is to have 35 years in business, I have a couple stats here. Uh-oh. So, <laughs> so let's see, 20, 20 or so percent of private sector businesses in the U.S. fail within the first year. That number jumps up after five years to about 50 percent of businesses. Um, and then after 10 years, it shoots up to 65, 70% of businesses, which, you know, those are pretty shocking numbers. And you've managed to do it for 35 years. And so I guess what's, what's your secret? You know, what has been your recipe for success that has, uh, has brought you here? I don't think it's one thing. I mm -hmm. do know that it's the people that I've surrounded myself with. Yeah. Um, and you know that's really important is to have a great supportive team. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that um, that happened early on at the colony is I hired a a, a management trainee to mm -hmm. come in and work with the restaurant from Johnson and Wales College yeah. named Phil Mancini, Phil, yeah, who is mm -hmm. today my partner. Um, yeah. So Phil started working for me at the colony, and uh, after I left, about two years later, he came and joined me. Um, mm -hmm. And we've been together, you know, ever since. Yeah. We, we went through that period of, of challenges with, with the restaurant, and another opportunity came up uh, when the Midtown Plaza um, mix of tenants changed in a big way. Mm -hmm. We have a beautiful atrium that was a shopping mall back then. You had yeah. to have a little vision for that. But there was a shopping mall there, and all the shops on the opposite side of the atrium for me were bought out by a grocery store that was expanding. So everybody on my side left. Well, Phil and I had started doing some catering around town, and mm -hmm. the only parties we weren't getting were probably the ones that we didn't have a space for. And so I realized, I got the plans for the building and realized that there was space right next to the restaurant where yeah. we could build, mm -hmm. build a ballroom. So in 1993, we wow. did that at the same time we came up with a very creative way to buy out all of our partners. And so at that point, Phil and I became 50-50 50 /50 partners. 50-50 partners. And that was the start of Michael Zani's ballroom. That was the start of Michael Zani's Which ballroom. I'm sure we have all been in before. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of head yeah. nods. And so what I'm seeing here is a lot of innovation, right? You know, you, you started this company. You brought in 17 partners. You got rid of them. You brought in Phil, who has been with you for a really long time. And you completely change, you know, kind of the schema of your restaurant by opening up that ballroom and focusing a little bit more on the catering and the banquets. And so how do you know when you're making the right decision in business? You know, how do you know when it feels right or when it's working or when you're going in the right direction? So one of the things that I learned during that first five years of the restaurant when we were experimenting like crazy, mm -hmm. I wasn't listening very well to my guests. Okay. With some of the things that we were offering, mm -hmm. I, you know, I was pushing it on them instead of listening to instead what listening. they were really wanting. So I think one of the, one of the takeaways for me that I, still, that I still use today is you've got to be a really good listener. Mm -hmm. You've got to be not afraid to hear the good, the bad, 
Um, and you know, sometimes you're going to hear a lot of people are going to fill your head with all the good stuff, but it's yeah. really important to know where you're failing or where mm -hmm. you're struggling, and also not to be afraid to reinvent yourself. Yeah, I like to think that we're continually reinventing ourselves and bringing new ideas. And you know, every year we we do some renovations to our operations mm -hmm. and and yeah. new training, new ideas. But you've got to listen. Mm -hmm. You really have no choice today with the way that. Um, that everything operates because you can find out on TripAdvisor or you know any of those websites how you did the night before. Yeah, you can really see when you're when you're not when you're doing uh, something we'll wrong. We'll have 60, <laughs> 70 reviews every week wow. from all different places. Yeah. And so you know we we talked a bit about innovating, and I want to point out you guys were the first to ever create a, a website for your restaurant, right? Yes. Tell us about that. So. so I'm a, I'm a techie anyways, and I'm always looking for what's new. Um, and so when the internet came along, I was really enthralled by that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there were a lot of, you know, ideas that germinated at the colony. Um, you know, we had the first of those wine nitrogen systems in the country. Serving Dom Perignon by the glass wow. was crazy, but mm -hmm. went, went great. Um, so, you know, so that was, you know, that was something that intrigued me. And yeah. uh, the gang at Comcast, which was, you know, the big um, cable, cable people in town, mm -hmm. came to me, Rich Swire, Sr. and Jr., which a lot of you may know them. Um, Rich Swire, Sr. said, we've got an idea, and Comcast wants us to build a website. And would you be interested in working with us on that? Mm -hmm. And I was like, hell, yes, I want to do that. <laughs> so at the time, you could... Um, you know, the website, the URLs were just starting to come out, so mm -hmm. I grabbed bestfood.com, bestwine.com, you know, all kinds of websites. And <laughs> you literally, that now? you know, before Google and all of that stuff, you had web crawler for web historians, and if you looked up restaurants, we were the only one that showed up. That was the only That's one. That's amazing. I remember talking with two publishers, the local publisher and the Florida publisher for the Herald Tribune yeah. in the restaurant one day, so excited about it. And they were like, Michael, calm down. This is just a fad. <laughs> this is, you know, this is, this is really not going anywhere. You and of course, you know where it is today. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That's such a great story. And so I kind of want to shift it back to the audience a little bit. You know, I'm sure some of you guys might have had thoughts um, maybe about starting a restaurant, or maybe about just starting something. I know we have a lot of entrepreneurs in the room. So, I mean, do you have any advice or someone, anyone that's just looking to start something new in their life? You know, I would go back to listening. Always listen. Listening, mm -hmm. do your homework. I mean, you know, yep. we can, Terry will tell you, my wife will tell you I'm a fact-finding maniac um, <laughs> when, I'm, when I'm working on a project. And, Mm -hmm. You know, it's, all, it's about surrounding yourself with great people. I am yeah. very fortunate to have my wife, Terry, as my partner. Yeah. Um, she mm -hmm. she is my strength. She is... <laughs> she, ter, anybody that knows her, she's a brilliant communicator and, an, and, a, and a brilliant woman, um, an amazing mom that, you know, raised my two oldest kids yeah. um, with me. And so, you know, Terry, I love you. Thank you. Aww. Yeah. <laughs> but oh, you know, that's so sweet. It's about it's about the people that you surround yourself with, and yeah. so bring, put a team together to be in support. Get people that you can trust. Mm -hmm. Have a great accounting person. Yeah. You know, have a great financial person, mm -hmm. and then do your homework. Yeah. And go slowly at it. I mean, building a restaurant today, um, it's incredibly expensive. Um, and, you know, we'll maybe touch on a new one that we're working on right now, yeah. which is incredibly challenging at Selby Botanical Gardens. Um, yeah, tell us. We're on our second go-round of building a restaurant there. Um, since the first one got shot down by the neighborhood, um, we're building a new, a new restaurant on the first level in that giant parking facility that okay. you see that mm -hmm. pops out, mm -hmm. and it's going to be the first solar-powered restaurant in the world. Wow. That's, that's so, quite the accomplishment. So a full service restaurant, um, all electric, 50,000 square feet of solar panels on the roof, 
Um, this has been no small feat. We had to figure out how much power each piece of equipment, right down to the blender in the kitchen, was going to use every day, peak hours, mm -hmm. how many hours a day. Um, it took months and months to try and figure out if there was going to be enough power. Yeah. It's even which I still say we really, really know till we turn it all on the first day. <laughs> But the engineers say we're okay. So, <laughs> and know. how did you come up uh, with the idea to to create that? You know, we've had we have a great partnership with Selby, and yeah. we've built a ballroom there too mm -hmm. on that property. And you know, their passion in this new project was to be able to be completely solar, po in fact, net positive. Net positive. So the okay. whole idea of that project is it's going to generate more power than it uses, mm -hmm. and. Um, and so Jennifer Romanecki, who's an amazing leader over there, is, um, came up with this concept and they put together an incredible team of mm -hmm. engineers and architects to do it. And they're doing it. That's amazing. So we hope to open um, in about a year from now. About a year from now. Yeah. That's pretty soon. That's quite soon. So I want to look into the past a little bit. and and. Let's shift to the, a time that we are all probably still a little bit scarred by, um, COVID. And I really do hate mm -hmm. to use buzzwords, but that was, that was an unprecedented time. I'm sorry for saying that. <laughs> and I think everyone in the community was probably looking at you. They were looking at Michael's on East as this huge you know, institution of a restaurant in Sarasota. And you guys were the first restaurant to publicly get a COVID positive staff member, or at least the first restaurant to really say that out loud. Um, and so what, what was that like for you? Well, in March of that year, um, we, you know, we knew that things were getting serious. Yeah, and all of a sudden bad. on a Friday mm -hmm. afternoon, the state said, you need to close today, now. Mm -hmm. So on a Friday when we had a full set of reservations for lobster night and all of that, we had 200 and something reservations, we had to cancel mm -hmm. and, um, and we closed, um, not knowing what was gonna happen. Um, speed ahead to the period when we were gonna get to reopen in June. Um, meanwhile, we kept all of our staff on, on salary. Mm -hmm. We, you know, we continued to pay everyone and, <laughs> yeah. So um, we helped a lot of them go, you know, go through that period. Um, before we were going to reopen, you know, we're, I'm on the most cautious side of things when yeah. it comes to that. And uh, one of my great friends from Cornell, who's a doctor, was heading up the infectious disease group in Sarasota. And um, I went to him and said, look, I, you know, what, what am I going to do, you know, mm -hmm. when I reopen? I said, I, I think I want to get everybody tested. And so we hired a local company to come in, um, and we tested 92 staff members over three days, and we had one come back positive. Mm -hmm. And wow. I was like, Andy, what do I do? You know, what do I do? Do I, do, I, do I hide this? Do I say something about this? What are other people doing? Um, and I decided that we needed to go public. We had yeah. um, Eleni Sokos is here someplace and she was working with us and you know we worked very quickly over you know um, just a couple of days. Mm -hmm. I mean I thought the world was coming to an end that day because yeah. we announced it to the public. We announced yeah. it to the press mm -hmm. and it was the front page of the Herald Tribune the next that's day. Such a hard thing to do like the authenticity that it takes to really just go public and be so transparent is, is really admirable. And at a time, too, when I think a lot of other restaurants were looking to see how you handled it. It gave us the opportunity, you know, to create trust. Mm -hmm. And so we like to say a lot that, you know, it was transparency through trust, trust yeah. through transparency. Mm -hmm. And um, that was our goal. And when we, were, when we did get that, um, that press, it allowed us to tell everything that we were doing to keep yeah. people safe, to keep our staff safe. Mm -hmm. All of the protocols that we were going through, which we were probably yeah. on the most conservative side of any, but any restaurant in the region. Mm -hmm. And instead of it um, killing us, it helped us. Okay. We built a, um, in three days, we built an online website and started doing takeout and delivery. Mm -hmm. We had a great yeah. delivery team because we had our valets that were already on, you know, already on our payroll. 
Um, all were certified to drive. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't have to hire one of the delivery companies. We had our own delivery team. So we built out a website in three days and reopened wow. that, following, you know, that following week. And um, it went crazy. It went I know, crazy. I know, I used it. Yeah, so, <laughs> I mean, I have, a, I, I have a, a time lapse of one of the holidays when we had 400 meals going through and the cars coming up on the valley and the trunk popped and next to the trunk popped next to <laughs> throw the food in, it was crazy. Um, so, you know, that allowed us to keep all the staff working too. Yeah. So for, for Phil and I, it was all about, you know, our staff is our family. And we treat them like family, right? And um, so that was that was huge. That's that's amazing. And you know, I know Florida opened up fairly quickly compared to a lot of other places, but I, we're still all feeling the effects of it. You know, whether it's the demographics of our higher risk community and you know worries about going to events or going to restaurants or staffing issues, expensive prices. So how are you how are you moving through all of that? What are you guys doing to kind of stay on top of it? We're continually reinventing ourselves. Yeah. You know, we're we're you know, we're making changes, we're, you know, we're exploring one thing that we will never do is cut the quality of what we do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when we went through the the recession in what was that 9 and 10, mm -hmm. um, where a lot of people cut their portions or cut, you know, the quality of some dishes. I said, no, we're going to keep this, we're going to keep our quality there. And so we're yeah. going to continue to do that. And we're going to trust that people are still willing to pay for that quality. Yeah. And I'm on the most, I'm the most cautious about pricing as I can be, mm -hmm. um, sometimes to my detriment. But, you know, I really, I hate that we're having to charge as much for a lot of products mm -hmm. as we do. Yeah. But I think people understand um, they may not come as often, but they're still coming. Mm -hmm. and, and you so, know that they're still going to have a, a, an incredible experience when they do yeah. come. And we're still not fully staffed. We're only mm -hmm. able to do dinners five nights a week when okay. we used to do six. And we used to serve lunch five days a week. And we're not open for lunch not yet. Lunch so, yet. Mm -hmm. you know, we're cautiously moving forward with this. We're not rushing. Um, there's an expectation from our guests of, yeah. of quality of service and food. and we can't compromise that, mm -hmm. and you shouldn't compromise it. No, no, you Don't, shouldn't. No shortcuts. Mm -hmm. And so, as you kind of keep on keeping on, and you keep pushing forward in Michaels on East, and you know, we all know that you're you're really innovative and you're really entrepreneurial, and I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure Terry can agree when I say that. You know, I don't know what you're cooking up in your head and how many ideas you might have. Um, for the future, and I know that we talked about one of them, which is you know the first solar-powered restaurant here, which is amazing. Um, but then you also do a lot more outside of that too, right? You're doing you're doing safaris and trips, and do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So one of the things that we created was unique for restaurants at the time was a loyalty program mm -hmm. um, that was at the time it included the family's resort on Longboat Key. Took me a while to convince my dad to join in with that, but eventually they did. So we have a, a loyalty program called the Gulf Coast Connoisseur Club. Okay. And you know, for the first year or two, it was um, only about people earning points in the restaurant or at the resort mm -hmm. or in the wine shop. Um, but then we started questioning people. We sent some questionnaires out, and they said, well, "What would you like to do?" And they said, "Well, you know, Michael, we see." you guys traveling all over the world to explore food and wine, we want to go. So we decided to start doing um, Connoisseur Club trips. Mm -hmm. And to date, I think Terry and I in 16 or 17 years have led now 40 groups, wow. literally all over the world. Wow. And you know, besides the fact of getting to know a lot of these folks, and we have people that are on their 12th, 13th trip with us, um, we get inspired. We get to experience yeah. all of these cuisines and cultures all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, we've become, you know, very connected to South Africa, and the Safari Lodge. You've probably seen some pictures of Terry and I there um, on safari. Mm -hmm. uh, we take groups every other year, and with wow. close friends of ours that are here, we've created a nonprofit or a, a nonprofit that supports a nonprofit in um, one of the most rural areas of South Africa. Mm -hmm and we're building digital learning centers wow. uh, in some of these rural areas. And to date, um, with Beth and Steve and Terry and others, we've got, um, I think, seven schools right now and 
six or seven thousand young people going through them every week. Oh, and that's so incredible. they're learning trades. Yeah. They're learning digital trades, things that will allow them in these rural villages, now that they've got internet, and I think in the first schools it was satellite internet, because it's very rural, yeah. um, where they can, they can have jobs that are you know, technology-based from there. Maybe they're learning graphic design, maybe they're learning accounting. Mm -hmm. you know, there's, um, there's courses for them to take to learn to work, work a front desk at one of the safari lodges or become a tracker. Mm -hmm. um, so it's incredible now. And we've brought that to Sarasota a few times called Safari Sarasota. Mm -hmm. We've been fortunate. Um, we honor um, one student every year. Our, our local organization is called the All Heart Fund. Okay. And um, we, we honor one student. Um, they choose one student each year. Um, not the student that's the hardest worker. Not the student that um, has the best grades, but the student with the biggest heart. Okay. Gets the All Heart Fund, the Leanna oh. Nopic Cup. Oh. And, mm -hmm. um, and so we've been lucky to be able to bring some of them to Sarasota and, and bring them out of their, they've never been on a plane, never left their village. Here they are dropped in Sarasota for this fabulous <laughs> event. And um, so that's one of the things that we love to do. Philanthropy is mm -hmm. a big part of Terry's and my life yeah. and our company's life. So mm -hmm. we're very proud of that. That's amazing. I mean, yeah, there's been so much that you guys do for the community whether it's the safari trips, whether it's bringing people here, the schools, and you do, you do a lot of work um, with children, right, and Make-A-Wish? Make-A-Wish, mm -hmm. the Child Protection Center, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, all of these, you know, children and family organizations yeah. are a priority, and, you know, Phil and I have always, want, we've always enjoyed helping out fledgling organizations, and there's yeah. hundreds of them over this 30-something years that we've helped come out of the starting gate, and mm -hmm. you know that's something that we're super proud of. And that's amazing. As you yeah. probably may have seen me on a few times, uh, became a charity auctioneer as mm -hmm. well, and yeah. I love raising yeah. money for these yeah. organizations. It gets a little out of control sometimes, but... Um, <laughs> In a great you know, way, right? It's, <laughs> it's, it's one of the other ways that we get to help mm -hmm. our community. Yeah. Well, I kind of want to bring us to a, uh, to a, a close here by talking a little more about community and your legacy that you're, you're leaving here. Because we started this conversation talking about the Bay Park, which is a legacy project. But can you just tell me a little bit more about you know, what you're trying to do in this community and how you're trying to impact the next generation through it? You know, one of the things that I like to say is you should always give more than you ever expect to get back. Yeah. And so giving to your community, giving to your community is one of the most important things that you can do. And it doesn't mean you're gonna contribute a bunch of money. It mm -hmm. might mean you volunteer to help an organization yep. or a project get started. Uh, I would say, you know, it's one of the most fulfilling things that you can do is to give. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes you get rewarded Sometimes you don't, mm -hmm. it doesn't really matter because in your heart of hearts, you're gonna know that you're doing something great. And we yeah. all have so many options in this community to give back mm -hmm. that um, I would say that, you know, that's one of the key things about, if you're gonna be part of a community, the door has to swing both ways. Yes. Mm -hmm. And, you know, being part of a community is contributing to it in some way, big or small. Mm -hmm. And we see all kinds of it. Mm -hmm. But this park is, this is, this is a park for all. Yeah. This is a park for our entire community. Um, welcoming, free. Um, it's it's gonna be a special place. Like I said, it's gonna be the part of our community where everybody meets. Yes. Young, old, rich, poor, whatever ethnicity they are. Um, it's gonna be the place where we can all come, have fun, um, enjoy celebrations. And mm -hmm. you know, as you've seen what Bill and his team are doing, building this park, it, it, it's incredible, the quality that's going into it. Yeah. I think in my, you know, my early dreams of this, I, I did not appreciate the kind of detail and the quality that we were gonna be able to provide. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is truly a legacy, and I hope that 50 years from now, when they look back, um, that they're gonna be able to say we did a good thing. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting, that I, I just realized that um, that first meeting um, with my board is going to be 10 years this October, which is going to be the grand opening of the first phase of the park. Amazing. So how about that?
And if, I, don't know if, I don't know if John Thaxton's still here, but they told us it was going to take us a lot longer to get this far. And um, so I encourage everyone to get involved mm -hmm. in some way in the community, big or small. It's going to make you feel good and, yes. you know, put your fingerprint on something. Mm -hmm. Well, Michael, thank you for sharing, you know, for sharing this time with us and sharing your wisdom with us. And I think we could open up to a couple audience questions. I know Anand's going to bring a microphone around if anyone has any questions. One over here. Thank you so much for speaking tonight. It's been very awesome to hear you. And um, I just, my question was concerning the uh, Sarasota Performing Arts Center. When people talk about the price tag of $300 million for this structure and how it's too expensive, what do you say to them? I think when we first started the project, um, we, we did tour around the country and visited some incredible performing arts halls. Um, Kaufman Center, um, Terry and I were in Berlin, we went to the one in Berlin. So there's a huge price tag um, involved in building a facility like that. It, one of the things, I didn't really get to touch on this, but one of the things that stemmed out of what we did here was an organization called Bayfront 2020 in the mm -hmm. early stages of the park. Yeah. And it meant, it, you know, it meant we were gonna do something great by 2020, which we, were, we did quite a bit by which then. And 20 colon 20, because it was gonna take clear focused vision to get us there. Um, it, one of the things that we learned at that time was that it's a very expensive thing to do. But if you go back, I think one of the key things that helped us get here and is always going to keep our park on track is the vision and the guiding principles that we created. If you go and look at the website and you read those, we've created a vision statement and there are six guiding principles. In this room, we had our first charrette meeting where our, our consulting firm from New York came in and we had round tables all over the place and everybody was busily writing ideas. Well, we did that across the community again and again and again. And each one of those guiding principles is a sorting point. And it was adopted um, in 2015 by the city commission as the basis for all decisions that are going to be made for this park. And today with our Bay Park Conservancy, just to step through it, we started with Bayfront 2020 and then we had um, the um, SVPO. The Sarasota Bayfront Planning Organization, mm -hmm. and then that became the nonprofit today called the Bay, Bay Park Conservancy. Um, the words in that document, in those guiding principles, are what we base every decision on. But I will tell you that there's a word that pops up multiple times in there that the community wanted something iconic. So what I would say is there's a price tag associated with iconic, mm -hmm. and um, you know, I don't have any, the only thing that I know for us as the Bay Park Conservancy Board is there is a big spot on that map for a performing arts hall. And our community is gonna tell us what they want it to be. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we go through the same process that we've gone through with the Bay Park, that they're going through and they're about five years behind us in that process right now, um, Hopefully, when they come through with their, what they really think they're able to do, um, I'm hoping that it's going to be something iconic. Yeah. I really do, because it's going to be, this whole park is going to be the centerpiece of our community. Any other questions? Got one in the front over here. Hi, Michael. Ashley Fons. Um, as a member of the Rosemary District, I was wondering, as you've been distributing surveys throughout the community, how are the uh, results of the surveys being used to um, develop the park and what tactics are being applied? Well, at this time right now, and, and we've been doing surveys all along. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't even know. Anand could probably tell you how many thousands of people 7, follow 000. us. 7,000. Yeah. 7,000. Yeah. Survey and these are active people. So we're constantly listening and learning from 
those surveys that we do. Mm -hmm. You know, we hear that they want to be able to connect to the park. We got to figure a way for them to get across 41 also at some point. Um, but, you know, I think that those are really useful and continue to help us and guide us. Right now, it's all about activation. So if you're seeing all those surveys, we're asking people, what do you want to see on the park? What do you want to see happen? What kind of activities do you want? One of the things that Anam will touch on is ways that we can all help with that. But, but the, um, the key is, is to keep listening to the community and we're testing things out. You see all the yoga classes, the performances that are there. Um, come see Chantel sometime. Um, but all of those, all that feedback that we're getting goes into this mix of all these different activities um, and activations that yeah. we're gonna do. And as the park opens, you're gonna continue to see us do that. That's one of the things that I love, as you guys learned, um, trying new things, bringing new ideas in, um, exploring different activations that we can do here. Mm -hmm. The sky's the limit. We don't even know yet what the possibilities are. Yes, absolutely. Got another question here. Hi, Michael, Hannah Hi. Phillips. So can you just tell me what a typical day looks like for you? Whoa. <laughs> like, That's a great question. Not the abroad stuff. I just want to know what your day looks like. It looks like I've got five or six balls and I'm trying to juggle them. I'm only really good at juggling two, but somehow I have a sorting point and a, and a fantastic partner and my wife that helps keep me on track. But, you know, there are so many different things happening um, in our operations, um, in the things that we're involved in philanthropically. Um, it's no day is the same. And I'm not one of those people that could sit in an office and do the same thing every day. I know that. So I like to be active. Um, uh, I enjoy working out. So I try to do that every day. Um, that's how I'm staying 27. And, <laughs> and um, you know, and, and not, not getting distracted or pulled off in different directions. So um, it's every day is unique. I'm lucky that I'm in the business I'm in because People come to us to come and celebrate and have fun. Yeah. I'm not sitting in an accounting office giving somebody the bad news about their taxes. So um, I love that part of the business. I love the people part. I love that we get to, well look, they give you a lot of good news too. <laughs> but um, as far as having a schedule like that, I would probably not, I mean, you're pretty good. You're gonna find me in the restaurant most nights walking around and talking to all the tables. I love that. I love connecting with people. So um, that's special. Another question. Well, well, I actually don't have a question. <laughs> but um, you guys, when I first started at Visit Sarasota County, after my first week, that's where I met. I got to stand up. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm in my 70s attire. But um, when I first started at Visit Sarasota County, excuse me, um, Michael and Dre in and Virginia Haley. I was just like this little new person and I got sucked into Sarasota Bayfront 2020. But what I want to say is how much I appreciate Michael and Dre in and our board. Me coming in from North Carolina because that's where I'm from and starting to visit Sarasota County. I did not know what to expect. But I appreciate them, especially Michael, because they put me into like this project. And it's amazing to meet so many people and to see so much that you do out in the community. You even, a lot of people think that I'm like very like outspoken and not shy. But I learned a lot from you after all these years that I've been at Visit Sarasota County. So I've learned a lot from you and I appreciate it. And I, you know, just love the whole the Bay Conservancy and seeing how it all conspire us being all in that room together and you just like giving this dream and all the trips, all of the hundreds of sticky notes yeah. that we have seen from the community. I, we probably did maybe over 200 like community meetings and events and stuff, trying to get the community input. That was Michael's big thing on this whole um, the Bay um, park that is coming a phase in the next couple months. So I appreciate it. I appreciate you. you too, Dre, and I appreciate both of you Thank because you. it really like opened me up and let me know like we can do this. We can do this if we all come together and be together as one. So I do appreciate Thank you all. Thank you, Chantal. <laughs>
Thank you, Chantel. And literally, Chantel was in this every step of the way, working with VSC and, you know, and helping us get there. And one of the things that, that has been awesome for me, one of the things I didn't really think about in this whole process was when we were doing the outreach across the community, I got to meet so many people and visit so many, I mean, I made presentations to every neighborhood all the way, I mean, all of our city neighborhoods, um, just about every condominium association, every, any organization that would listen to me, I was there to tell them our story. And uh, it was a gift for me to get to know the diversity and how special our community is, even more than I thought it was growing up here. So um, that was a bonus for me, I think. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Chantal. So I want to give Michael a huge round of applause. Julia, too, for running the conversation tonight. Thank you, Julia. As you can tell, we began here and we ended here, but um, I have had the personal pleasure of kind of following in Michael's footsteps. I picked up the pieces after BPB, I'm sorry, Bayfront 2020. Drayton, Virginia, John Thaxton, who's not in the room, Virginia Haley and Michael, and began on the process of kind of shaping what became the Bay, creating the name the Bay and everything else. But the simple reason is this, is that great parks make for great cities. Yes. You don't need to be a futurist to realize that. And you can stand here today and just see just the improvements that have happened in just what you look out to 41 and realize that this is a transformative project that's forever going to redefine Sarasota, not just in our generation, been on in our kids' kids' generation. And it's very rare that you get the opportunity to work on or contribute to a project that has a generational gap. And so that's one of the reasons why I personally got involved. You asked a question about what do we do with the surveys? We have surveyed a lot of people. We've made 315,000 connections to shape this story. Um, and it's been an incredible journey to understand what the public want. They have told us, as Michael said, exactly what they want to see in this park from music performances, food and beverage festivals, you name it, all the way to yoga and environmental tours. And that's what we have been programming. And over time, as we have refined this story since 2018, what we have learned is that more and more people have committed to come and visit here. So 95% of those that we've surveyed have said that this is a place that I would come and visit with my friends, my family, my parents, whatever it might be. And I think that's a really important perspective. That's awesome. And so all kinds of types of activation that's all free, open, welcoming to all. And that's a very important point. You can pick up a rack, a rack card for the month of August, but just in the month of August, this is what's happening. And the numbers are growing every single day. And it's all free. Which brings me to a really important point. Michael touched upon this. This October, together with One Park, we are going to open this park on October the 13th. I'm oh, sorry, October the 14th <laughs> through the 23rd. It's 10 days of an opening. It goes from Friday to the following Sunday. And so you need to mark these dates in your calendar. And let me give you some perspective. You saw what people wanted to see. Well, we're going to deliver it en masse. We're bringing in national artists. We're bringing in local national artist, Chantel, will be part of our production that, that week. Um, we're partnering with the originals to do a Taste of the Bay, and there's all kinds of exciting opportunities for you to engage in this. But this is where it gets even more interesting, is that in this short span of time, while the Bay is being kind of a glimmer here, developing quietly under Bill's leadership, we've been collecting business partners that have helped us pull this together. And all these companies have contributed $2,500 to help us pull this off and make sure it's free. We're trying to get 100, we're at about 65. And if half the people in this room signed up tonight, we could pretty much fill that quota and we would guarantee free programming for the next year for every park visitor that came on site to the park. So you recognize a lot of these companies. These are companies that truly believe in the Bay and what it stands for, what it can be. And I want to single out an individual here in the audience, Amber Lamison. Can you stand up a second? Amber is our director <laughs> of development. If you have a thought about getting involved, and I'm going to turn it back to Michael for a second, because when we launched this program, he was the first person to sign up. And just to explain why he did it and how it represents truly the creation of One Park for All. And 
Just as a footnote, after that, Bill Waddell, who you guys have seen on YouTube, I don't know how many YouTube videos we shot with him, <laughs> has agreed to give anyone who wants a tour of the Bay Park, particularly phase one, um, when we wrap up tonight. And, um, and it's gonna be a sunset tour, right, Bill? 15 minute speed tour. 15 minute speed tour. <laughs> so Michael, why did you get involved in you know, um, business partners? As, as I said at the very beginning, it's a legacy project and you know, it is about what we're leaving for our kids and grandkids. But as a business owner, I looked at it as, this is a place that I want my, my staff and their families to be able to enjoy and celebrate. And so, you know, for me um, and for us as a company, you know, that's, we decided to get behind it because, you know, we want to be able to have all of these free activities for our staff and their families and their kids and grandkids. So for me, it was a no-brainer. I mean, we, we need to do this. Local companies um, all supporting this. $2,500 a year um, it really assures us that all of these activities are going to be free. So, I mean, how many things do we get to do in our lives that are free? But if our business community gets behind this, and big or small, um, most businesses can figure out a way to hammer that out, especially if you put it in terms of I'm doing this and I'm going to be able to share this with my staff that, you know, we contributed to this. We'll help you organize a special event here, especially when this first phase of the park opens up. You're going to want to have a company party. You're going to want to have a company um, think tank come out here. So there are so many opportunities for businesses to take advantage of this. But mostly it's about giving something that your staff is going to really be, in, be able to enjoy as a gift to them. And that's how we presented it. It was a gift to our staff. Yep. So real quick, next month, the indomitable Michael Saunders is going to be <laughs> here yes. speaking. And I've got a surprise. The month after, we're bringing in Mark Pritchett, who recently announced his retirement. Oh, great. So he's going to come and share his story and journey. So these are the next two dreamers and doers. If you want to take the tour, you're going to meet Bill in this corner over here. He's going to come over here. And uh, Bill, you want to say anything about what you're going to show them or say a few words? Awesome. Highly recommend it. Let's give Michael and, Julia another round of applause. And, and hopefully, hopefully some of you, some of our companies that are here will talk to our team and agree to come and join this family of givers to our community. But thanks everybody. It's been my Thank honor. Thank you.